Two Purse Companions by George Parsons Lathrop. Everybody in college who knew them at all was curious to see what would come of a friendship between two persons so opposite in tastes, habitudes and appearance as John Silverthorne and Bill Vibbert. John was a hard reader, and Bill a lazy one. John was thin and graceful, with something pensive yet free and vivid in his nature. Bill was robust, prosaic and conventional. There was an air of neglect and a prospective sense of worldly failure about Silverthorn, but he would at once have singled out Vibbert as being well cared for, and adapted to push his way. Their likes and dislikes even in the matter of amusement were dissimilar, and Vibbert was easy-going and popular, while Silverthorn was shy and had few acquaintances. Yet, as far as possible, they were always with each other, they roomed, worked, walked and lounged in company, and often made mutual concessions of taste so that they might avoid being separated. It was also discovered that though their allowances were unequal, they had put them together and paid all expenses out of a common purse. Their very differences made this alliance a great advantage in some respects, and it was rendered stronger by the fact that, however incompatible outwardly, they both agreed in acting with an earnest straightforwardness. But perhaps I had better describe how I first saw them together. It was on a Saturday, when a good many men were always sure to be found disporting themselves on the ball field. I used to exercise my own muscles by going to look at them, on these occasions, and on that particular day I came near being hit by a sudden ball, which was caught by an active darting figure just in time to save my head from an awkward encounter. I nodded to my rescuer, and called out cordially, thank you. All right, said he, in a glum tone meant to be good-naturedly modest. Look out for yourself next time. It was Bill Vibbert, then in the latter part of his freshman year, and not far distant I discovered his comrade Silverthorn, watching Bill in silent admiration. They continued slowly on their way toward an oak grove, which then stood near the field. Silverthorn, a smaller figure than Vibbert, wore a suit of uniform tint, made of sleazy gray stuff that somehow at once gave me the idea that it was taken out of one of his mother's discarded dresses. His face was nearly colorless without being pallid, and the faint golden down on his cheeks and upper lip, instead of being disagreeably juvenile, really added to the pleasant dreaminess that hung like a haze over his mild young features. He was slender, he carried himself rather quaintly, but his gait was buoyant and spirited. At that season the lilacs were in bloom, and Silverthorn held a glorious plume of the pale blossoms in his hand. What the first touch of fire is to the woods in autumn, the blooming of the lilac is to the new summer, a mystery, a beauty, too exquisite to last long intact, evanescent as human breath, yet like that, fraught with incalculable values. All this Silverthorn must have felt to the full, judging from the tender way in which he held the flowers, even while absorbed in talk with his friend. His fingers seemed conscious that they were touching the clue to a finer life. In Vibbard's warm, tough fist, the lilacs would have faded within ten minutes. Vibbard was stocky and muscular, and his feet went down at each step as if they never meant to come up again. He wore stylish clothes, kept his hands much in his coat pockets, affected high-colored neck scarfs, and had a red face with blunt features. When he was excited, his face wore a fierce aspect, when he felt friendly, it became almost foolishly sentimental, as a general thing it was morosely inert. Being in my senior year, I did not see much of either Vibbard or his friend, but I sometimes occupied myself with attempts to analyze the sources of their intimacy. I remember stating to one of my young acquaintances that Vibbard probably had a secret longing to be feminine and ideal, and that Silverthorn felt himself at fault in masculine toughness and hardihood, so that each sought the companionship of the other, hoping to gain some of the qualities which he himself lacked, and my young acquaintance offended me by replying, as if it had all been perfectly obvious, of course. After I had been graduated, and had entered the law school, Silverthorn and Vibbard came to my room one day, on a singular errand, which, though I did not guess it then, was to influence their lives for many a year afterward. Ferguson, began Bill, rather shyly, when they had seated themselves, I suppose you know enough of law, by this time, to draw up a paper. Yes, I suppose so, or draw it down, either, I replied. But I saw at once that my flippancy did not suit the occasion, for the two young fellows glanced at each other very seriously and seemed embarrassed. What do you want me to do? I asked. Silverthorn now spoke, in his soft light inexperienced voice, which possessed a singular charm. It's all Bill's idea, said he, rather carelessly. I would much rather have the understanding in words, but he, yes, broke in Bill, growing suddenly red and vehement, I'm not going to have it a thing that can be forgotten. No one knows what might happen. Well, well, said I, if I'm to help you, you'd better fire away and tell me what it is you're after. 
I will, returned Vibard, with a touch of that fierceness which marked his resolute moods. Thorny and I have agreed to stand by each other when we quit college. Men are always forming friendships in the beginning of life, and then getting dragged apart by circumstances, such as wide separation and different interests. We don't want this to happen, and so we've made a compact that whichever one of us, Thorny or me, shall be worth $30,000 first, why that one is to give the other half. That is, unless the second one is already well enough off, so that to give him a full half would put him ahead of whichever has the 30000 Do you see? The idea is to keep even as long as we can, you know, said Silverthorne, turning from one of my books which he had begun to glance through, and looking into my eyes with a delighted, straightforward gaze. That's a very curious notion, said I, revolving the plan with a caution born of legal readings. Before we go on, would you mind telling me which one of you originated this scheme? I was facing Silverthorne as I spoke, but felt impelled to turn quickly and include Vibbard in the question. They were both silent. It was plain, after a moment, that they really didn't know which one of them had first thought of this compact. Wasn't it you? queried Silverthorne, musingly, of his comrade. I don't know, returned Vibbard, then, as if so much subtility annoyed him, what difference does it make, anyway? Can't you draw an agreement for us, Ferguson? But I was really so much interested in getting at their minds through this channel, that I couldn't comply at once. Now, you two fellows, you know, said I, laughing, are younger than I, and I think it becomes me to know exactly what this thing means, before proceeding any further in it. How can I tell but one of you is trying to get an advantage over the other? The pair looked startled at this, but it was only, I found, because they were so astonished at having such a construction put upon their project. Don't be alarmed, I hastened to say. I wasn't serious. But Vibbard persisted in a dogged expression of gloom. It's always this way, he presently declared, in a heavy, provoked tone. My father, you know, is a shrewd man, and everybody is forever accusing me of being mean and overreaching. But I never dreamed that it could be imputed in such a move as, well, never mind, he suddenly exclaimed in a loud voice. And with assumed indifference, getting up from his chair. Of course it's all over now. I shan't do anything more about it, after what Ferguson has said. He was so sulky that he had to resort to thus putting me in the third person, although he was not addressing these words to Silverthorne. Then he gave his thick frame a slight shake, as if to get rid of the disagreeable feelings I had excited, and turned toward his friend. On the instant there came into his unmoved eyes and his matter-of-fact countenance a look of sentiment so incongruous as to be almost laughable. I wish I could have done it thorny, said he, wistfully. Hold on, Vibbard, I interposed. Don't be discouraged. He paid no attention. Upon this Silverthorne fired up. Hello, Bill, this won't do. Do you suppose I'm going to let our pet arrangement drop that way and leave you to be so misconstrued? Come back here and sit down. Vibbard was already at the door. As for your getting any advantage out of this, is it likely? Why, you are well off now, to begin with, that is, your father is, and I am poor, downright poor, Ferguson must have seen that. Here was a surprise. The dreamy youth was proving himself much more sensible than the beefy and practical one. Vibbard, however, seemed to enjoy being admonished by Silverthorne, and resumed his seat quite meekly. To me, in my balancing frame of mind, it occurred that one might go farther than Silverthorne had done, in saying that any advantage to Vibbard was very improbable, one might assume that it was surely Silverthorne who would reap the profit. But I decided not to disturb the already troubled waters any more. Silverthorne, however, expressed this idea, you'll be thinking, he said to me, with a smile, that I am going to get the upper hand in this bargain, and I know there seems a greater chance of it. But then I have hopes, I, the dreamy look, which I have described by the simile of a haze, gathered and increased on his fair ingenuous young face, and his eyes quite ignored me for a moment, being fixed on some imaginary outlook very entrancing to him, until he recalled his flagging voice, to add, well, I don't know that I can put it before you, but there are possibilities which may make a great difference in my fortunes within a few years. I fancied that Vibbard gave me a quick, confidential glance, as much as to say, don't disturb that idea. Let him think so. But the next moment his features were as inert as ever. It turned out, on inquiry, that only Vibbard was of age, his friend being quick in study, had entered college early, and nearly two years stood between him and his majority, so that, if their contract was to be binding, they would have to defer it for that length of time. I was prepared for their disappointment. But Silverthorne, after an instant's reflection, seemed quite satisfied. 
As they were going, he hurried back, leaving his friend out of earshot, and explained himself, You see, Vivard has an idea that I shall never succeed in life, financially, that is, and so he wants to fasten this agreement on me, to prevent, pride or anything making me back out, you know, by and by. But I like all the better to have it left just as it is for a while, so that if we should ever put it on paper he needn't feel that he had hurried into the thing too rashly. I understand, I replied, and I pressed his hand warmly, for his frankness and genuineness had pleased me. When they were gone, I pondered several minutes on the novelty and boyish naivete of the whole proceeding, and found myself a good deal refreshed by the sincerity of the two young fellows and their fine confidence in the perfectibility of the future. It seemed to me, the more I thought of it, that I could hold on to this scheme of theirs as a help to myself in retaining a healthy freshness of spirit. At any rate, I said, I won't allow myself to go adrift into cynicism as long as they keep faith with their ideal. From time to time during the two years, I encountered the friends casually, and I remember having a fancy that their faces, which of course altered somewhat, as they matured, were acquiring a kind of likeness, or, rather, were exchanging expressions. Silverthorns grew rounder and brightened a degree in color, his glance had less momentum in it, he looked more commonplace and contented. On the other hand, Vivard, through mental exertion, for he had lately been studying hard, and the society of his junior, had modified the inertia of his own expression. The strength of his features began to be mingled with gentleness. But this I recalled only at a later time. Near the end of the two years' limit, when the boon companions were on the eve of taking their degrees, I found that another element had come into their affairs. Going out one evening to visit a friend who lived at some distance on one of the large railroads, I had a glimpse of a small manufacturing place, which the train passed with great rapidity at late twilight. The large mill was already lighted up, and every window flashed as we sped by. But the sunset had not quite faded, and, from the colored sky far away behind the mill, light enough still came to show the narrow glen with its wall of autumn foliage on either side, the black and silent river above the dam, the sudden shining screen of falling water at the dam itself, and again a smooth dark current below, running toward us and under the railroad embankment. There was a small settlement of operatives' houses near the factory, and two or three larger homes were visible, snugly placed among the trees. We were swept away out of sight in a moment, but there was something so striking in that single glimpse, that a traveler in the next seat, who had not spoken to me before, turned and asked me what place it was. I did not know. I afterward learned that it was Stansby, a factory village perhaps forty miles from Cambridge. Finding that the memory of the spot clung to me, I wished to know more about it, and one day in the following spring, when I needed a change from the city, I actually went out there. Stansby did not prove to be a very picturesque place, yet its gentle hills with outcroppings of cold granite, the deep-hued river between, and the cotton mill near the railroad, somehow roused a decided interest which I never have been able wholly to account for. I enjoyed strolling about, but was beginning to think of a train back to Boston, when a turn of the road, a quarter of a mile from the mill, brought me face to face with a young girl who was approaching slowly with a book in her hand, which she read as she walked. She was not a beautiful girl, and not at all what is understood by a brilliant girl, yet at the very first look she excited my interest, as Stansby Village itself had done. In every outline and motion she showed perfect health, her clear color was tonic to the eye, her deep brown hair, at the same time that it gave a restful look to her forehead, added something of fervency to her general aspect. In sympathy with the beautiful day, she had taken off her hat, which she carried on one arm, disclosing a spray of fresh lilacs in her hair. She was very simply, though not poorly, dressed. All this, and more, I was able to observe without disturbing her absorption in her book, but just as I was trying to decide whether the firm, compressed corners of her mouth only meant interest in the reading, or indicated some peculiar hardness of character, she glanced up and saw my eyes bent upon her. Then, for an instant, there came into her own a look of eager search, no softly inquiring gaze, such as would be natural to most women on a casual meeting of this sort, but a full, energetic, self-reliant scrutiny. I don't think the compression about her lips was softened by her surprise at seeing me, but that keen level look from her eyes brought a wonderful change over her face, so that from being interesting it became attractive, and I was fired by a kind of enthusiasm in beholding it. Involuntarily I took off my hat, and paused at the side of the highway. She bent her head again, perhaps with some acknowledgement of my bow, but not definitely for that purpose, because she continued reading as she passed me. But now came the strangest part of the episode. This girl disappeared around the bend of the road, and after her two young fellows drew near whom I recognized as Vivard and Silverthorn. 
It happened that Silverthorn, as on the very first day I had ever seen him, carried a sprig of lilac. Happened? No, the lilac in the girl's hair was too strong a coincidence to be overlooked, and I was not long in guessing that there was some tender meaning in it. Hello. Ferguson. Did you know we were here? These exclamations were made with some confusion, and Silverthorn blushed faintly. No, said I, do you come often? They looked at each other confidentially. We have, lately, Vibbert admitted. Then perhaps you can tell me who that girl is that I just passed. Oh, yes, said Silverthorn, at once. That's Ida Winwood, the daughter of the superintendent here at the mills. She is a very striking girl, I said. You know her, of course? A little. Vibbert enlarged upon this, it was a curious habit they had fallen into, of each waiting for the other to explain what should more properly have been explained by himself. Thorny's father, you know, said Bibbard, was a great machinist, and so they had acquaintances around at mills in different parts of the state. She, that is Ida, you know, is only sixteen now, but Thorny first saw her when he was a boy and came here, once or twice, with his father. Silverthorn nodded his head corroboratively. But it seems to me, I said, addressing him, that you treat her rather distantly for an old acquaintance, or else she treats you distantly. Which is it? They laughed, and Bibbert blurted out, with a queer, boyish grimace, it's me. She don't like me. Hey, Thorny. It's nearer the truth, returned his friend, to say that you're so bashful you don't give her half a chance to make known what she does think of you. Oh, time enough, time enough, said Bibbert, good-humoredly. Remembering that I must hurry back to catch my train, I suddenly found that I had been in an abstracted mood, for I was still standing with my hat off. Well, let me know how you get on, I said, jocosely, as I parted from the comrades. Yet for the life of me I could not tell which one of them it was that I should expect to hear from as a suitor for the girl's hand. It was within a fortnight after this that they came to my office, for I had been admitted to the bar, and announced that the time for drawing up their long pending agreement had arrived. They were still as eager as ever about it, and I very soon had the instrument made out, stating the mutual consideration, and duly signed and sealed. Finding that they had been at Stansby again, I was prompted to ask them more about Ida. Do you know, I said, boldly, that I am very much puzzled as to which of you was the more interested in her? They took it in good part, and Silverthorn answered, that's not surprising. I don't know, myself. I'm trying, said Bibbert, bluntly, to make Thorny fall in love with her. But I can't seem to succeed. No, said his friend, because I insist upon it that she's just the woman for you. Bibbard turned to me with an expression of ridicule. Yes, he said, Thorny is as much wrapped up in that idea as if his own happiness depended on my marrying her. Your rivals then, after a new fashion, was my comment. Don't you see, though, how you are to settle it? No. Why, each of you should propose in form, for the other. Then Miss Winwood would have to take the difficulty into her own hands. Ha, ha, laughed Bibbard. That's a good idea. But suppose she don't care for either of us? Very well. I don't see that in that case she would be worse off than yourselves, for neither of you seems to care for her. Oh yes, we do, exclaimed Silverthorn, instantly. Yes, we care a great deal, insisted Vibbard. They both grew so very earnest over this that I didn't dare to continue the subject, and it was left in greater mystery than before. At last the time of graduation came, and the two friends parted to pursue their separate ways. Silverthorn had a widowed mother living at a distance in the country, whose income had barely enabled her to send him through college on a meager allowance. He went home to visit her for a few days, and then promptly took his place on a daily newspaper in Boston, where he spent six months of wretched failure. He had great hopes of achieving in a short time some prodigious triumph in writing, but at the end of this period he gave it all up, and decided to develop the mechanical genius which he thought he had perhaps inherited from his father. I began to have a suspicion when I learned that this new turn had led him to Stansby, where he procured a position as a sort of clerk to the superintendent, Winwood. After some months, I went out to see him there. In the evening we went to the Winwoods, and I watched closely to discover any signs of a new relation between Silverthorn and the daughter. Mr. Winwood himself was a homely, perfectly commonplace man, whose face looked as if it had been stamped with a die which was to furnish a hundred duplicate physiognomies. Mrs. Winwood was a fat, woolly sort of woman, who knitted, and rocked in her rocking chair, keeping time to her needles. A smell of tea and chops came from the adjoining room, where they had been having supper, and there was a big, hot-colored lithograph of Stansby Mills hung up over the fireplace, with one or two awkward-looking engravings of famous men and their families on the remaining wall spaces. 
Yet, even with these crude and barren surroundings, the girl Ida retained a peculiar and inspiring charm. She talked in a full, free tone of voice, and was very sensible, but in everything she said or did, there was a mixture, with the prosaic, of something so sweet and fresh, that I could not help thinking she was very remarkable. In particular, there was that strong, fine look from the eyes which had impressed me on my first casual meeting in the road. It had a transforming power, and seemed to speak of resolution, aspiration, or self-sacrifice. I noticed with what enthusiasm she glanced up at Sil Verthorn, when he was showing her some drawings of machinery, executed by himself, and was dilating upon certain improvements which he intended to make. Still, there was a reserve between them, and a timidity on his part, which showed that no engagement to marry had been made, as yet. He was very silent as we walked together beside the dark river toward the railroad, after our call. But, when we came abreast of the dam, with its sudden burst of noise, and its continual hissing murmur, he stopped short, with a look of passion in his face. Things have changed since Bibbard went away, he said. Yes, yes, very much. I used to think it was he who ought to love her. And you have found out, I began. He laid his hand, quickly on my arm. Yes, I have found that it is I who love her, eternally, truly. But don't tell any one of this, it seems to me strange that I should speak of it, even to you. I cannot ask her to marry me yet. But there seems to be a relief in letting you know. I was expressing my pleasure at being of any use to him, when the ominous sound of the approaching cars made itself heard, and I had to hurry off. But, all the way back to the city, I could think of nothing but Silverthorne's announcement, and suddenly there flashed upon me the secret and the danger of the whole situation. This girl, who had so much interested the two friends, in spite of their strong contrasts of character, was, perhaps, the only one in the world who could have pleased them both, for in her own person she seemed to display a mixture of elements, much the same and quite as decided as theirs. What then, if Vibbard also should wake up to the knowledge of a love for her? The next time I saw Silverthorne, which was a full year later, I said to him, Do you hear from Vibbard anything about that agreement to divide your gains? No, he replied, avoiding my eye, nothing about that. Do you expect him to keep it? Yes, he said, glancing swiftly up again, with a gleam of friendly vindication in his eyes. I know he will. But I hear hard things said of him, I persisted. Reports have lately come to me as to some rather close, not to say sharp, bargains of his. He is successful, perhaps he is changing. For the first time I saw Silverthorne angry. Never say a word of that sort to me again, he cried, with a demeanor bordering on violence. I was a little piqued, and inquired, well, how do you get on toward being in a position to pay him? But I regretted my thrust. Silverthorne's face fell, and he could make no reply. Is there no prospect of success with those machines you were talking of last year? I asked more kindly. No, said he, sadly. I'm afraid not. I shall never succeed. It all depends on Vibbard, now. I cannot even marry, unless he gets enough to give me a start. I left him with a dreary misgiving in my heart. What an unhappy outcome of their compact was this.